Just Mike, could you get those doors back there, please? Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are studying Isaiah, and this morning our goal is to start around chapter 6 and work our way to chapter 10. And uh, so thank you for being here, and open up your Old Testaments there, and we'll begin shortly. Let's start with a prayer. Ray Coney's, could you lead our thoughts, please? Dear Father in heaven, thank you that we're able to be here today. Show your word, and uh, be with Philip now as he brings us uh, his thoughts on uh, your servant Isaiah's uh, book. And uh, help us, Father, to be good listeners and students. And Father, be with um, those who can't be here for health problems and challenges. And um, help us to minister to them any way we can. And be with the other teachers meeting today also. And thank you, Father, for the message and the content that we're about to hear today. And it shows your love for us and your mercy and uh, forgiveness uh, when we're faithful to you. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So, the prophets regarding Bible writings is an area we probably spend the least amount of time in those books. I think that can be safely said. We're trying to compensate for that this year. <laughs> and I'll set that. Uh, and they're also the books that are the most challenging to us typically. And we continue to recycle some of the ideas and thoughts about the prophets this year in different venues so that we can get a bit better grip on the prophets. And so this is sort of putting together some things we've talked about off and on over the last several weeks already. Why is it that we struggle with the prophets? Actually, some of the language is pretty simple. It's figurative in many cases, but it's pretty simple. There are some sections that are very challenging, especially the prophetic aspects as far as the foretelling. We'll talk more about that even in the sermon next Sunday, Lord willing. I think one of the main reasons why the, cha the prophets challenge us is because the prophets are written within a historical context. There's a historical background to a certain prophetic book, whether it be Isaiah, whether it be Hosea, Malachi, whatever. And that historical background is assumed when you open the book. It's not always something you can put together as you read the book. You get little snippets, but you have to have the other Old Testament history to do that. Well, one of the reasons why the prophets are a challenge to us is because the divided kingdom period is a challenge to us. The divided kingdom period recorded there in 1st, 2nd Kings, as well as the Chronicles, uh, which really focuses just on Judah, that is a section we spend the least amount of time in in the Old Testament as far as the Old Testament narrative goes. And on top of that, it's a challenging history. So we've emphasized that over the last several weeks. I, you really have to be on your toes when you study the divided kingdom. you got two different, different kingdoms and their histories are intertwined. And you got kings on both sides, and sometimes their names are alike, and sometimes their names are identical. They're, they may be 100 years apart, but the names are the same name. And so it is so challenging to keep that straight sometimes. And it's a very quick history. It's a very concise history. And so what that means is when you study the prophets, you got to do some heavy lifting. You just have to work a little harder at it. A lot of you are very familiar, like, with the Gospels and the book of Acts and the letters of the New Testament and the books of Genesis and Exodus and the writings of David and the Psalms and Solomon and the Proverbs. You know why you are? Because you spent a lot of time with it. You've made effort. Uh, you put something into that. So whenever you encounter someone who knows little about the Bible and you start talking with them and they're like, how do you know all these things? Well, because you did the work. You did the lifting. That's why. So all it is is a matter of putting the time in and, and doing the lifting. And so uh, in today's section, though there is always a historical backdrop, there is a real strong dimension of a historical backdrop to Isaiah 7, 8, 9, and 10 especially, those chapters. 
Uh, and you can sort of piece it together a little bit as you study those chapters, but it's a challenge. And so that's what, it's one of the important things we need to do this morning as we work through this material. So let's look at chapter 6 first of all. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on chapter 6, and the reason why is because I did a whole sermon on it. Thank you, Kathy. It's so good to know that somebody remembered. Thank you very much. So that was, we studied Isaiah 6 as our introduction to the prophets. That was the first sermon I did on the prophets back in January, even before Tommy came and, and visited with us that weekend. And so it, it, I just think it's a great introduction to what's happening in the prophetic literature. It's so important to us. Well, uh, what do you make of this? Here we are in our English Bibles, and this is the sixth chapter of Isaiah. And it contains Isaiah having a vision of the Lord that leads to his calling to be a prophet. Now, where would most of us think Isaiah's call to be a prophet should go in this book? Very beginning, at the very first chapter. And you see that in Jeremiah, and you see it in Ezekiel in a way. So that makes perfect sense. But here it is. And you know what? I really don't know why. And sometimes we waste time trying to figure out why it's placed, something is placed somewhere, when really we should focus on what does the placement do for us. For instance, have you ever been reading a book or watching a film and there's a flashback? So the story is going, but then there's a flashback to something that happened 10 years before. And it serves a purpose to put the flashback there. I think it's what's happening. So Isaiah, the first five chapters, start off really with very representative prophecies. Prophecies about Israel and Judah's sins. Prophecies about God's judgment. Prophecies about God's hope that he's offering in the future for his people. So it's very representative. You can take the first five chapters of Isaiah and say, wow, this is just like this and this and this that's found other, in other places in the prophetic writings. And so after this, after this sampling of Isaiah's writings and Isaiah's preaching, then we have the background as to how he became a prophet, like a flashback. And so, uh, how did this vision that he has, I'm not, we're going to spend much time on it, how does this vision that he has, how does it affect Isaiah? He sees the Lord as much as a human can. It's a vision. <clears throat> Goes without saying, he saw a grand, glorious scene, okay? He also saw himself in relation to it. That's right. It humbled him, and he confessed that he was a person of unclean lips, living among a people with unclean lips. He realized his great deficiency before God, doesn't he? And then there's this symbolic part of it that his mouth is cleansed, you know, with this, with this coal, hot coal from God. Uh, and then God's looking for... Someone to go and preach. And Isaiah said what? Here am I, send me. And what does God tell him about his task, his mission? They're not going to listen to you. I want you to go preach to these people. However, they're not going to listen to you. Uh, that's really not the recipe for an excitement about a job, is it? It's not at all. But hopefully, after we've read what we've read, and Jonah and Joel and Amos and Hosea and our work here in, in Isaiah and other things we're doing on Wednesday nights, hopefully you understand the value of that. That these prophets are not going to get a great response. And so, there's a huge lesson there. We do what we do for God, not for people. And whenever we catch ourselves saying, well, people don't appreciate this, and people aren't doing this, and people aren't responding this way, and people, people aren't cooperating here, we're missing the whole point. I love every one of you, and I want the best for you. And I want you to go to heaven. And I, 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 
you're my brother and, and you're valuable to me. And it's taken me a long time to learn this lesson. But I don't preach and teach for you. For God. Now, the secondary goal is that in that you're helped. And I, I try to be very conscious of what you need and what would help you and, and take that into consideration. But that's a lesson we all need. When you serve your brethren, when you do things in the church, when you do things in the kingdom, you're first doing it for God. That's it. And uh, if other people appreciate it, if other people you know, respond in a positive way, that's, that's great. If they don't, was God pleased? That's all that matters. It's all that matters. And these prophets had to live that every day. And, uh, and it might be, we talked about how they're courageous and tough. These guys are made out of grit. There's no soft tissue among these guys. Okay? Um, and I think maybe that's why. They, they knew what they were up against. They were up against walls. And so they had, their heads were hard. <laughs> they were, they, these guys were stubborn. They were stubborn. And you see that even with the non-writing prophets that oftentimes the people or the kings would get really aggravated with how stubborn they were. They were stubborn for God and his will. Okay, chapter 6 there. So keep that flashback in mind. Anything you want to add to that? Chapter 6. It's just a real healthy chapter to go back and read every now and then. Okay, so let's look at chapter 7 now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you the title of this section, and that is King Ahaz, who is a king of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. So he is a king in the lineage of whom? Who's his ancestor? His name is David. Okay, he's in the Davidic kingdom. So he is assured that Ephraim, which is another name for Israel, and that's very common in these chapters here in Isaiah. Why is Ephraim a synonymous term for Israel, the northern kingdom? What was Ephraim? It was, Ephraim was a tribe. Ephraim was a son of Joseph, and he got a large portion. So it's, it's like saying things that happen in California, Texas, New York, and Florida affect all the United States. They're the biggest states. Okay, that carry a lot of weight and things that happen. Okay, whether economically, politically, socially. Okay, things that happen in those places creep into the other states. Okay, good or bad. Uh, technologies, everything. That's Ephraim. Ephraim was a leading dominant tribe because one of these early wicked kings of Israel, first of all, made Samaria the capital. They put a lot of the idolatrous activities in Samaria and some of the cities, especially some of the southern cities. And so it just becomes a trend-setting tribe. So it becomes synonymous with Israel. So King Ahaz of Judah is assured that Ephraim, or Israel, and Syria is going to fall. So look at this map here. So here's Israel and here's Judah. Here's Jerusalem. And then here's Samaria, which is the capital of Israel. You'll notice here that just to the north of Israel is Syria, which is roughly in the same place where Syria is today, which is very much in the news. It's also referred to in the prophetic writings as Aram. This is Syria, not a Syria. This is Syria. And so this is a neighboring kingdom to Israel. So if, 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 if Syria is your neighbor, they can either be a what or a what? Friend or a foe. Friend or a foe. So that, watch how Syria plays in here. So in ancient times, just like modern times, international relations were characterized by alliances and threats. Just take that template. Alliances and threats. Think about all the modern current events right now that are being played out in light of that template of who's aligned with whom and who's a threat to whom. Okay, it's being played out in the Middle East right now. It's being played out in Eastern Europe regarding Ukraine and Russia. That's, that's the way it's always been. 
So you would think that though they had this division and separated, that Israel and Judah should have more in common than, you know, things to separate them. That's not the case. Sometimes a lot of cultures that are similar will combat each other. So Israel and Judah at times are on fairly friendly terms, but most of the time they're not from the point that they divided. And Israel is usually the bully. They've got more money, they've got more people. And so they tend to be the heavy. And what has happened here is that Israel has aligned themselves with Syria and they are eyeing toppling Judah. That Israel really would like to topple Judah. And with Syria's help. And of course, they're all looking for something to gain from it. Okay? So, this is a very threatening time for Judah. Well, go with me. Who is this King Ahaz? Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 16. We'll spend a moment on this because it's of benefit. 2 Kings chapter 16. We know that all of the Israelite, all the Israel, all of Israel's kings were idolatrous. All of Israel's kings were wicked men. Judah, it's a mixed bag. Well, look at Ahaz. Uh, chapter 16, Rick, will you read verse 1 to 4 about Ahaz? He's introduced to us, and let's see what he's like. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, became king. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and even made his sons pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out from before the sons of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. All right, thank you. Now, look at his, look at his family. His father, whose name was Jotham, did walk faithfully with the Lord. And his grandfather was uh, Josiah, if I'm not mistaken, okay? Uh, maybe I messed that up. Uh, see what I mean? You gotta be on your toes. Uh, I'm serious, okay? Um, oh, Uzziah, I'm sorry. Josiah is much later. Uzziah is his grandfather, another faithful king. And then his son, look at chapter uh, 18, at the beginning of 18, who's his son? Hezekiah, who's a reformer, he's one of the real outstanding, faithful kings to the Lord, which tells us something. Why did he have to be a reformer? It's because of his predecessor, his father, Ahaz. Ahaz was one of the unfaithful kings of Judah. How bad was he? Pretty bad. How bad was he? What? He offered his children to the false gods. That seems to be like the low point. Manasseh did the same thing. That really precipitates the fall of Judah. So when you stoop that low as an idolater to offer your children to these false gods, that's bad. So that's Ahaz. <laughs> Got it? And we're told in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 that Isaiah was a prophet during the reign of Uzziah and, and, and uh Ahaz here and Hezekiah after him. And so this is that period in which Isaiah is working as a prophet. And look what happens. Rick, keep reading. Read verse 5. Then Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. All right, so there is that description of Israel and Aram or Syria forming an alliance and coming against Judah and coming against Jerusalem. Yet, and this is still so today, there are strategic points where a military has to take that point, take that location or they can't subdue the land. Judah will be invaded several times. The critical question is, will Jerusalem fall? If Jerusalem falls, Judah's done for. If Jerusalem does not fall, then they have a chance of survival. There's a good chance of survival. So that just happens, okay? That just happens in, the, in these kinds of affairs, even in modern times. So 
I think if Kiev fell in Ukraine, that would be it probably for Ukraine. So that, that's just how these things kind of go. So see the threat that Ahaz is under here by Aram or Syria and Israel to the north. And then look down at verse 7. Read that, Rick. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and deliver me from the hand of the king of Aram and from the hand of the king of Israel who are rising up against me. Okay, and what is described over the next couple of verses is that when you hire help to come help you, what must you do to get their help? you got to pay. And so he had to strip resources and treasures of Judah to pay Assyria to help him. So do you see that? Look who's, look who's entered the scene. Assyria. Much more on them later. So what was Ahaz's stance and response to the invasion of Israel and Syria. How was he going to handle the situation? Get help. Get help from Assyria. Well, let's go back to Isaiah 7. To whom should have he looked for help? God. You talk about a consistent pattern in these kings of the Old Testament. It's a fascinating relationship, the kings and the prophets. It's fascinating is that when a king would rely on God or a king would turn to other nations for help, that was critical. And some of the kings of Judah were tempted uh, in that, and this is one of them. So uh, let's go to Isaiah 7 now. Look at verse 1 and 2. Justin, can you read verse 1 and 2 for us? Uh, Isaiah 7, back to Isaiah, sorry. Isaiah 7, 1 to 2. Now we, See, we've got the historical backdrop. That's the, that's the situation. Now, look at Isaiah's account of it. And this is one of those occasions where there's some narrative dropped in to Isaiah's prophecy. So Isaiah 7, 1 and 2. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying... The Arameans have camped in Ephraim. His heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Okay, so how did Ahaz respond to the threat? How did he emotionally react to the threat? Verse 2. In Texas, they say he was what? Shaking in his boots. Okay. Uh, he's shaking like a trees in the forest for a great wind kind of thing. One another. That's right. His knees smote one another. His knees smoteth one another. That's King Rick Harrington's King James Version. So that he, this is a real serious threat. That's, that's the whole point of that. Well, Isaiah injects himself here. Uh, the Lord has him to speak. And look at verse 3 to 9. Verses 3 to 9. Becky, when you read that for us, Isaiah 7, 3 to 9. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear nor be faint hearted. For these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria, and the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabeel. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within sixty-five years Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not even be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe me, surely you will not be established. All right. So in spite of Ahaz's unfaithfulness, God speaks to Ahaz through Isaiah and gives him what here? Hope, assurance, comfort. Uh, in verse 4, what does he call Israel and uh, Syria or Aram? Little smoldering firebrands. Is that, is that a depiction of their great strength? No, it's, it's, they're small and weak. 
Now, did they look small and weak probably to Ahaz? No. But to whom did they look small and weak? To God. In the prophets, what we have is God's view of things. If only we could develop that. Allow the scriptures to shape our vision of things. So, and in verse 8, what prophecy does he make about Syria, or and Damascus is their capital, as it still is, and uh, of Ephraim and Samaria? What prediction is made? Shattered. And, and, and how specific is this uh, prophecy of their demise in 65 years? Wow. And there should be comfort in that specific. Now, the problem is what? With 60, you got a problem today and somebody says, hey, this is all going to be taken care of in 65 years. First of all, I'm out of here in 65 years. What about you, Frank? What, are you, what will you be doing in 65 years? Okay. Okay. So, Frank and I are both out of here in 65 years. Okay. And so, that's just how it is. There's some people in this audience that might be around 65 years. But that's not, that doesn't seem to be a great comfort. And this is, wow, this is one of the important points when you read the prophets, especially about the Messiah. There are things said to comfort the people. But it's going to happen 65 years later or 70 years later or 200 years later or 400 years later. Okay. It's a real challenge. We'll, we'll deal with that a little bit more later. But God is telling him, don't worry about them. And actually, here's, he's giving Ahaz a chance. In verse 9, look at the end of verse 9. The English standard says, if you're not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. What do other translations say there at the end of verse 9? You will not last. You won't last. Established. Okay. So, if you don't have faith, you don't have anything. In other words, if you'll stand in your faith, you'll stand. In other words, if you'll listen to me and trust me, you'll make it. That's what he's telling Ahaz through Isaiah. And you're talking about really giving him a chance here. Um, and, and then... In verse 10, again, the Lord said, this is probably another occasion, as these events are not happening overnight. Um, what, look at verse 10 and 11. Tommy talked about this chapter real quick, quickly in one of his sermons. But look at verse 10 and 11. What does the Lord offer Ahaz? A sign. What was Ahaz's response to the sign? Verse 12. No. I, I, and the way he couches it is what? I don't want to trouble the Lord and tempt the Lord that you have to prove something to me. Okay, it sounds like Ahaz is so profoundly spiritual that, God, you don't have to do that for me. Well, how spiritual was Ahaz? He didn't even have a thimble full of true spirituality in him. He was a, he was, we could say that he was a godless pagan. That would be a fair assessment in light of what we read a while ago and Rick read for us, 2 Kings 16. Uh, he doesn't want God's help in this. Why? What's his plan? Assyria. Assyria. Well, two things happen here over the next couple of chapters. One is God's going to give him a sign anyway. And the other thing is he's going to tell him what Assyria really is. And what they're going to do. Yeah, Jeff? Yeah. Irony. Getting them to focus on that part of the world is not a, not a good thing. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of irony here. Assyria is not their help. Assyria is going to be their curse. So, uh, the uh, sign, according to verse 14, is what? A virgin shall give birth. Now, this, there's some controversy about this term virgin in the original Hebrew uh, language. It basically means a young maiden. Okay, what's a young maiden going to do according to this verse? She's going to give birth. So it can mean either a young girl or it can mean a virgin. You can be a young girl and not be a virgin, but if you're a virgin, you're usually a young girl. She's going to give birth. Well, if this is the work of God, it's not likely 
that this is an illegitimate birth, okay, kind of thing, um, and that it, it's use of an unmarried girl, okay? It's not it's use of a maiden, not a married woman. Just like the French have a term for mademoiselle and madam, married and unmarried. We have miss and missus. So this is a term for an unmarried maiden. And she cannot be a virgin, that's possible. But this is a work of God here. So that's why translators have always leaned toward the virgin interpretation of this. And when you see the way it's used in Matthew 1, it lines up, okay? Because that's where you see it. So the sign is, before a virgin gives birth in this child, okay, as it says there, knows good and evil. Verse 16, in other words, before this child gets very big, what's going to happen? At the end of verse 16, what's going to happen to the king of Israel and the king of Syria? Wiped out. So again, an assurance that Israel and Syria is not a threat to you. So this is where the prophecies get challenging. How is it that the birth of the Messiah 400 years later... No, it's 600 years later, seven, almost 700 years, seven, oh, whoa, it's more like almost 800 years later. Okay, there we go. My brain had to catch up to where we're at. Almost 800 years later, how is the Messiah's birth going to be comfort to Judah at this point and King Ahaz? Well, it's a great question, and we'll keep working on that this year. <laughs> but it's like this. God is saying, trust me. Um, in the future, I'm in control and my plan is going to be carried out. That's what he's communicating. And look at verse 17. Uh, what does he depict in verse 17? Does it sound like something wonderful or something sort of scary? <laughs> scary. And he compares it. Not since what days... It's like somebody saying, we just had a flood in Asheville, and we've not had a flood like that since 19, when was that big flood? 16, 17, Frank, when was it? You remember? <laughs> okay. It was, it, was, it was a huge flood in Asheville around 1916, something like that. Okay, 17. Huge flood. You don't remember? Okay. It's like somebody saying, we've not had a flood like that since 1916, whatever that year was. It's right in there somewhere. What does he refer back to? It's going to be such days since what? Since when Israel broke or Ephraim broke from Judah, the beginning of the divided kingdom, which is during the reigns of Jeroboam and Rehoboam after Solomon. And that was a shock. You got God's people who divided, and then they became, you know, they had an animosity toward each other. They almost had a war with each other. I mean, that was a devastating thing for Israel to be broken up like that. It's like a civil war, like in America kind of thing. And not since those days have you experienced something like this. You know what's going to happen? Assyria is going to happen. Assyria is not only going to take care of Syria, not only Assyria is going to come in and wipe out Israel, Assyria is going to deliver a vicious blow to Judah, though it won't be toppled. More on that later. So, in other words, you think things are bad now, Ahaz? You think Israel and Syria are a threat? They don't compare to what's going to happen. And he's going to get into that here. So, you know what? <laughs> Again, this, is, this benefits us. If you are a selfish, selfish, shallow person focused on the moment, none of this means anything to you. You're talking about things in the future. That's not helping me today. And that's a challenge that we have as God's people. Is that he calls us to have faith and wait on him. Yeah, yes. So what you say about God's vision of things versus ours, oftentimes the problems in front of us are so important to us that we can't see God's plan as, as, as being revealed. And God is speaking here of time frames that exceed the lifetimes of perhaps the people that he's speaking to. Absolutely. And that happened in the prophets, happened in, perhaps in Daniel's time, and 
things that would come to pass at a later time. But Hebrews makes it clear that that um, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. There were things that were coming on, and he says. Um, uh, all these having gained approval through the faith did not receive what is promised. There is a, there is a, a thing that was happening that God was speaking of that exceeded, far exceeded the time on earth. And our seeing it as God sees, the vision, the eyes that God has, uh, we have to think beyond perhaps what is directly in front of us and the problems that are facing us at the very moment. You have something on that line? Yeah, well, okay, go, I, and then I'm going to add. Go ahead. I think the assurance is that, that God, and you indicated this already, but that God is in complete control of everything that is happening. And that's where the, the, the assurance really lies, it seems to me. So we know for sure Isaiah is writing about one thing that's going to happen in 65 years, just a long time, to a human. He's describing the Messiah, which is going to be centuries later. And that's, you see that a lot in the prophetic writings, things that are happening way, 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 way down the line. Now, let's think about this. To the Lord, a thousand years is what? And a day is as a thousand years. Now, what that means is not just that the Lord is so eternal that a thousand years passes like a day as much as God doesn't measure time. Time is all about constraint. I've got an hour to do this. God never works that way. God never has only an hour to do anything. God never has even only a century to do anything. He may take five centuries before he does something. In other words, God operates outside of time. Our faith has to do the same. Our faith has to operate outside of time. It's not about what God's going to do and when he's going to do it. It's about trusting that he'll do what he says he's going to do. This is not for wimps, is it? I mean, this is what you call big boy pants faith, what the prophets are requiring of us. It really is. Mike? I just would like to add that I mean, even when you're talking about chapter 6, about, hey, Isaiah, you're going to go out and do all these things, or, you know, I'm going to make you do all these things, you're not going to listen, and, you know, the personal perspective might be, well, what's, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't sound good for me, you know, but God's plan <laughs> yeah. is completely different. Yeah. There's no difference in what he's telling Ahaz here. Right. And the perspective, as Justin said, I think the same thing can be found in our perspective. We have to take the long view of, of our lives. We have to think about our children's grandchildren. And are they going to remain faithful by our influence today? I mean, how are we as a church, how are we as a society going to, going to be workers in God's kingdom? We just studied this in Romans chapter 12, and I think I read these first two verses at this time. It says, I beseech you, brethren, therefore by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. That's your job. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect what? Will of God. It's God's will that you be a Christian and that you think and take the long view and not be concerned about so many of the little petty things that we can be concerned about today. God has a plan. Do your job, which is to be a Christian. We know from 2 Peter 1 and other things that the prophets did not have a complete mastery understanding of what they were writing about. They didn't understand all the particulars about the Messiah and his kingdom, okay? But think about this. Isaiah had some idea that in the future, near future, medium future, far, 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 far off future, God would be God, he would rule, he would be victorious, his people would be blessed, he would do great things. He knew that. So even he had that task of, uh, that's described at the latter part of Isaiah 6. He has to go and speak to a people who will not hear, to a people who will not see. Isaiah still knew because of these prophecies that will come through him that though he may not see certain results, that God's plan will always be accomplished and great things will come from that. 
Isaiah knew that, didn't he? And so, again, this is a lot of faith we're called to have in God's work. So, um, and, this, and this, is, this is what we do with the prophets. There are so many particulars that are challenging, and sometimes the specifics elude our grasp, but it's pulling these kinds of grand thoughts. That's how they help us. So, uh, what happens next here uh, is that he continues in chapter 7. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, he, he yeah, chapter 7. I haven't looked, I haven't done that part. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you look here after he gives the sign of the virgin being born, that, that terrible things are going to, that, that the, Israel and Syria will be defeated. Those two kings will be defeated. However, what you need to really worry about, verse 17, is days where something bigger is going to happen. And look at the metaphor. It, it, he, at the end of verse 17, what does he say? What, what's going to be the big threat at the end of verse 17? He just says it here. King of Assyria. See that? That's what you really should be concerned about. And there's the irony that Joe mentioned. He thought that, Ahaz thought that was the help. No, that's the real threat in the long run. Years ahead, many years ahead after Ahaz. So look at the metaphor he uses, metaphors he uses about the Assyrian invasion, which will happen to Israel and Judah, by the way. Verse 18, it's going to be like what? God's going to call for what? Flies and bees, okay? Now, um, now, here's the thing about it. That doesn't sound like that big of a deal. But how did little flying creatures affect the Egyptians? Okay? Because look at the description here. Uh, this bee is going to be in the settle in the ravines, the clefts of the rocks, the thorn bushes, and all the pastures. In other words, it's going to just blanket everything. Okay? Yeah, Joe? Before the Israelites. Yeah, which again was metaphoric, okay? And if you've ever been around a hornet, they're pretty scary, but they're small, okay? It's metaphor. This is metaphoric. He is going to invade the land with the Assyrians like a bunch of killer bees everywhere. Now, what's the other metaphor in verse uh, 20? Assyria's invasion is going to be like what? Like a man shaving with a razor. So here you got a bunch of hair on your face and you take a sharp razor and pff, there it goes. And it's just clean and it's like a baby's bottom like mine this morning. Okay? Clean. All gone. That's the kind of invasion Assyria will have. And we've already talked about how vicious the Assyrians could be. So, which brings us to chapter 18. We're going, it's all the time we have. So what happens really over the next couple of chapters, 8, 9, and the beginning of 10, is that he elaborates on this invasion of Assyria, why they're coming in and how bad it's going to be. But let me just make this one point, and there is reference to it here in chapter 8. We've talked about how that, I'm going to bring this up here, this map. We've talked about how that Assyria is going to come and conquer Israel. And Israel will fall and be wiped out by Assyria around 722. B.C. And we talk about later that Babylon, that Judah will invade Babylon and conquer Babylon. That's nearly, nearly 150 years later. What we sometimes miss, it's right there in the text, but the simplification of what happens in the divided kingdom overlooks it, is that Assyria is also going to threaten Judah. Judah is going to be wiped out by Assyria except Jerusalem. Assyria will mow through Judah like a man cutting his beard off with a razor. Except Jerusalem. More on that later. Okay, thank you very much.
Good morning. Certainly is good to see everyone this morning. So good to be here on the first day of the week to gather our voices and our minds, our hearts, to participate in the learning that's been going on in the last hour and in this hour uh, we'll be worshiping the Lord. So if you're visiting with us, we appreciate your presence here and so thankful for each of the members here. We have been reading through Hosea still in our uh, weekly congregational readings. I just wanted to uh, begin with a few thoughts from chapter 6. Um, he makes this statement, Hosea does, regarding Ephraim and Judah's faithfulness it is not good. He describes it like a, a, a cloud in the morning that sort of just is there and then it disappears. And then he describes it as a dew in the morning that is there and just disappears very quickly. And of course, all of us that live here in the mountains are very familiar with this kind of phenomenon. We'll see fog rise out of the valley in the mornings and as soon as the sun comes up, you know, it just it dissipates. It's just sort of gone. And that's the way that Hosea here is describing this, their faithfulness or their loyalty to God is just like this. It's sort of there for a moment and you can see some evidence of it, but then it just disappears. Earlier in this chapter, in fact, the verse before this in verse three, God describes himself and his reliability and his trustworthiness is like the sun coming up every morning. Uh, God has, uh, the, he says, uh, God is described, his going forth is established as the morning are the words that are used in the New King James. So his, his, God himself, even though the, his people are here and there, and sometimes they seem to be following God and other times not. But God himself is as reliable and trustworthy as the sun rising in the morning. That's the point. Like, it's, it's going to be there. It's not like the fog. It's not like the dew. It's not like a little cloud in the morning. The sun is going to rise. And God is like that in that he is reliable. He is trustworthy. And God is the one who has set this earth spinning and it will continue to spin until God stops it. And so God is reliable. And verse three says, let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. In verse 6, he says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. This world is full of distractions and uh, pursuits, where it says we should pursue the knowledge of God. This world is always offering all kinds of distractions and pursuits, things that you can pursue. But we, we have to, as Christians, we have to be very purposeful, intentional, and conscious, conscious of actually pursuing the knowledge of God. That's what he wants us to do, to pursue the knowledge of the Lord and make that a priority in our lives. Because it is in him that we have life, we have our being. Jesus came and in him was life and, his, and the life was the light of men there in John 1 and verse four. So let us show our faithfulness and our loyalty to him, not only in this hour as we gather our, our voices together and sing praises and pray and partake of the Lord's Supper and hear a message from God's Word. But every day, that's the point of this illustration that Hosea gives. Don't, don't, we don't want to be 
like the cloud that disappears in the morning or the, the dew that as soon as the sun rises just burns it right away and burns it off. No, we want to be reliable and loyal and faithful to the Lord like the sun rising, like God is, because God is faithful and loyal to us. So let us enter into our worship. The first song this morning is going to be number 55. The title and the first part of this song says, The Lord is in his holy temple. I ask a question. Is he? We are described as the temple of the Lord. Is God in his holy temple? Let all the, the earth keep silent before him. Are we silencing the world? Putting it aside for service. One simple verse. Think about what it says and think about who we are and where we should be. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Keep silence. Keep silence. Keep silence before him. At this time, have a word of prayer. Please pray with me. Lord, as we bow our heads before you this morning, we recognize that it is only by your grace and your kindness that we are able to enter into your presence, presence in prayer and worship this morning. When we look at ourselves and who we are before you, we must recognize that we were all dead in our trespasses and sins without Christ, without hope, and without you in this world, far away from your promises and your protection. But Lord, you and your mercy and your compassion and your love for us saved us, not according to our works which we have done, not by our own strength, but, but, but by the mighty power of your hand. You have raised us up to walk in newness of life, taking away the law of sin and death that was against us, and through the cross of Jesus Christ have made us alive together with him. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for everything you have done from the foundation of the world to bring about such a great salvation. And as we consider this salvation, Lord, we realize there's nothing we can do, no prayer, no song of praise, no sacrificial offering we can make that is worthy of what you have done for each of us but we pray that you will accept our humble worship this morning. We pray that you help our focus to be true, our thoughts to be pure, and our minds to be attentive as we come before you at this time. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. 
Amen. Number 412. God is love. The first verse is a call for us to come and sing. I ask that you do that as we sing this song. Come, let us all unite to sing. Two hundred eighty two.
205. <clears throat> After this song, we'll take the Lord's Supper. A different song for the Lord's Supper than usual. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance of the promise that was made. It's been mentioned in verse 4. The Lord has promised good to me. To remember that promise, the fulfillment of that promise, and what that promise offers us. Just raise your hands and someone will bring them to you. I'm really glad that Neil picked that song, Amazing Grace, at the end. Because that song is, is so true. It, we pretty much would be, we would be lost in this world without Christ. 
um, when Adam sinned in the garden, that brought about a, a terrible storm that hit humanity. And um, there, w- there was no way to get redemption from that other than through the blood, the blood of Christ. In um, the Old Testament, the blood that was sacrificed daily in the temple and the tabernacle when the Israelites were in the wilderness, it was not enough to cover sin. And the high priest himself had to offer uh, a sacrifice for himself every year and for the people. And he had to have a sacrificial lamb, and that lamb for us is Christ. Perfect son of God came here, lived the perfect life, died for our sins. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we should get our minds uh, and thoughts in, in, in perspective. Um, think, get thoughts of the world. I know a lot of times when, when you're here, you know, don't think about what you're going to eat afterwards. Don't, don't think about uh, things that you have in, in going on in the week. Just, just think about that, what happened 2,000 years ago, um, how Jesus went through that horrible punishment suspended between heaven and earth for our sins, that we put him there. We, um, our sins made it so that he had to do that for us. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll be reading in verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He that eats and drinketh unworthily eats and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us give thanks for the bread at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of your Son, Jesus whom he sent here to this dying world, Heavenly Father, that went through the, the beatings and, and the torture um, for our sins. Thank you for this bread. We pray that as we partake of it, that we would do so in a manner pleasing to you, that we would examine ourselves and, and thus partake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Jesus, which was shed on the cross for our sins. Again, we pray that all who partake of this do so in a manner that is pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, uh, we are commanded as Christians to lay by in store, the first day of the week. Um, if you are visiting with us, we do not solicit donations from you. However, we would ask that you would please put the visitor's card and the two trays at the, at the end tables as you leave. Please give uh, thanks with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you above all, Heavenly Father, for your spiritual blessings, the blessings that we have in Christ, that we are able to be called your children. We thank you also, Heavenly Father, for the country that we live in, and we thank you for uh, the material blessings, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would um, give us wisdom and understanding to be good stewards of these things. We pray that uh, the men here and the elders of this church, Heavenly Father, would, uh, would use these funds in a manner that is pleasing to you for the furtherance of your kingdom in this area. And, and we ask these, these things in Christ's name. Amen. Number 180 is the invitation song, if you're marking those in the books. And Neil will lead us in that song at the conclusion, 180. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody here and your interest in spiritual things. Never underestimate what an encouragement your presence is. And uh, you are communicating something to your brothers and sisters, but especially to God. And thank you so much. And we welcome those who are visiting with us. And we trust that your time with us will help you draw closer to God and understand him even better. What would you think of a chair that held you up 50% of the time? Well, it'd probably go to Goodwill, right? Maybe not even Goodwill, probably go in the garbage. What if you had a car that works 75% of the time? And let's just increase the percentage. What if you, there was an airplane that functioned 90% of the time? In a way, those numbers begin to mean nothing if something is unreliable. We all value reliability, and so does God. So this morning, we're continuing uh, in our series, or our, our focus this year on ancient prophets for today's believer. And this is one of the Sundays I'll do a sermon from the prophets. And now we're going to start doing certain texts that we'll focus on in the prophecies. And this morning, we're going to focus on Hosea. We are reading Hosea right now. And so we're going to be looking at really the underlying message of this book. We know that after reading a little bit in Hosea, and some work we've done on Wednesday nights that what's happening in Hosea is that the message of the prophecy is about how Israel had been unfaithful to God, like Hosea's wife was an unfaithful spouse. But I want you to look at the underlying principle to that. Now, I usually don't coordinate with the song leader, although Neil asked me for some suggestions and those were very good songs for us. And I didn't coordinate with Les regarding his comments. But it is so, it, it's dovetailing really nicely today. Here's why. This morning, we have focused on the faithfulness of God's love. And we're going to go in and look at some passages, including the one that, that Les cited. But what Les caused us to do, and the things that we've done, including the prayer and the supper, is it's focused our attention on the faithful love of God. But there is so much said in Hosea about the unfaithfulness of the people who should have been God's people. And that's gonna be our focus in contrast. So turn with me to Hosea chapter two. And we see early on these references to God's faithful love, but Israel's unfaithful commitment. In Hosea chapter two, verse 19 says, and I will betroth you to me forever I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. This is one of those sections in the book that actually is referencing God's plan for what he wanted to do with Israel if they come back to him. But it represents what he wanted all along in a relationship with these people. He wanted a relationship based on a faithful commitment. 
But that's not what he got from Israel. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. Just read from the English Standard Version, which says there was an absence of faithfulness and steadfast love. The New American says faithfulness and kindness. New King James says an absence of truth and mercy, or, or, and mercy. And you can see the connection there between the idea of faithfulness and truth. Something that is true is faithful. Something that's faithful is true. So there's a little bit of elasticity in some of these translations, but they're really driving at the same point. What God had shown to them, faithfulness and love, was not reciprocated. And then look to that text that, that we started off with this morning in Hosea 6, verse 4, where though most of what is said in Hosea is directed at Israel, even some of those prophetic works will say something about Judah, and this is one of them that does that. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim, which is synonymous to Israel? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. As Les pointed out, the morning mist doesn't last long. Morning dew doesn't either. Remember when you were a kid and it was summertime, you went out early to play and you got your feet all wet in the grass? It was not long until the grass was dry and your shoes were dry. Because the morning dew goes away when the sun gets warm and hot. It says there in verse 6 in the English Standard Version, I desire steadfast love. The New American says, I desire loyalty. The New King James says, I desire mercy. And this term here that's used is found in several places in the Old Testament, and it's a, it's a flexible term. And it's the context that determines really what it's driving at here. In some places you see the idea of steadfast love, sometimes mercy. And see the context here in light of verse 4 about the morning cloud and the morning dew that goes away early. That this context here is talking about loyalty. That God had not found loyalty and faithfulness among the Israelites. Their commitment to God was shallow. Now... What's happening here with God and these people? Here's an important point to remember as we study the prophets. And we see them time and again be condemned for their unfaithfulness. Israel and even Judah, in their periods of unfaithfulness, they never quite dismiss completely the worship of Jehovah. The calves that Jeroboam set up at the beginning of the divided kingdom in Dan and Bethel were gods, were idols that were set up to worship Jehovah, just like the golden calf was at Mount Sinai. And there are some occasions where basically in Judah, worship was shut down. But for the most part, there was some kind of effort being made to worship Jehovah while they also worshiped other gods. And oftentimes their efforts in worshiping the pagan gods, well, those efforts were more intense and even more sacrificial. And so that's why the prophets of the Lord, including Hosea, describes God's people as being adulterous. That's a common idea because they were wedded to God, but they were involved with other gods. And here in Hosea and some other places, but especially Hosea, it's described as that they were committing harlotry. And this is why in chapter 6, verse 6, God says that he didn't care for their sacrifices and burnt offerings. 
I mean, at one level, we humans think that, well, if someone is offering a gift to God, that's a good thing, and they should be encouraged in that. And God said, I don't want it. I don't want your sacrifices and offerings. Because it was not coming from loyalty and a steadfast love. It's like the man who's been at his girlfriend's house and goes home to his wife and on the way stops and picks her flowers up and gives to her. It's exactly what it's like. And this idea of God being faithful in his love to them and he wanted steadfast love from Israel, it's the right idea in the book of Hosea because look in chapter 3, verse 1 at the statements that's made there. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. <clears throat> In a way, chapter 3, verse 1 is the key to the whole book. Though they turned to other gods, but what had God done for them? He had loved the children of Israel. So in light of this book, Hosea, that we're reading right now, here's a great question for us as today's believers as these ancient prophets are still speaking to us. And the question is, is your love for God fickle or steadfast? How can we have a steadfast love for God? How can we develop dependable faith in him? Well, consider with me several things that are addressed throughout the book of Hosea and what they reveal to us. First of all, look with me in chapter 2, verse 8. In chapter 2, verse 8, God is condemning Israel for their unfaithfulness, but he reflects back on what he had done for Israel. And he says in chapter 2, verse 8, And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for a bell. We know that in the big scheme of things in the Old Testament that the Israelites started off as a large group of people in bondage. And God saved them from Egyptian slavery, brought them to this land, defeated their enemies before them, and gave this productive land to them. And they took their resources and used them to worship other gods. I mean, that's, that's a heartbreaker. And then if you look in chapter 11, verses 1 to 4, Hosea proclaims for God, and he is speaking in the first person for God, as he's directed by the Spirit. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the bells and burning, idols, and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke of their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. Well, a big chunk of the book uses the idea of a husband-wife relationship to describe Israel's unfaithfulness to her husband, God, the book suddenly shifts in the latter chapters where there are references or there are pictures of the idea of God being a parent and Israel being children. And that's so in chapter 11. He bent down. He cared for them, protected them. He fed them. That's why he calls Israel my son in verse 1 there of chapter 11. God wanted Israel to remember what he'd done for them. I think sometimes my problem is I simply focus too much on what God has not done for me and on what I want him to do for me and not on what he has done for me. 
That messes me up a lot. Sometimes there's a strain in a relationship between two people, two friends, maybe two family members, spouses, whatever. And someone says, well, look all that I've done for you. And sometimes that's used in a manipulative way as if you owe me something or so forth. But sometimes there is a legitimate case for that statement. Look what I've done for you. Because God often does that in the prophets. We see two cases of that here in chapter 2 and in chapter 11 and so many other places. God is saying to Israel, this is what I've done for you. Don't you see how good I've been to you? Our faithfulness will set up like concrete sets up when we really see how faithful God is. In other words, God's loyalty to us can breed and build in us loyalty to him. But we've got to see that. What else helps us to maintain a faithful, steadfast love? Well, go with me to chapter 8. In chapter 8, verse 9, the prophet writes, They have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up, and the king and princes shall soon writhe because of the tribute. And then a similar statement. Look over with me in chapter 12, verse 1. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all day long. They multiply falsehood and violence. They make a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. Remember, the prophets, writing mostly in this prophetic verse, uses figurative language. We said it this morning in Isaiah class how that there was a period there during the rule of King Ahaz of Judah when Israel to the north and Syria, just to the north of Israel, called also Aram, was threatening to invade Judah and take over Jerusalem. And King Ahaz sent for Assyria to help protect them and pay them tribute. Now, that is one example of many during the divided kingdom when either Israel or Judah looked to some other nation to protect them. Even references here to Israel looking to Assyria. And we saw this morning in the Isaiah's prophecy that it would be Assyria that would be the greatest threat to Israel and even to Judah up to the point of the Babylonian invasion. What was Israel and Judah both doing in these instances? Whenever they faced a difficult time, even a threat, they didn't completely trust God. They turned to someone else to help them. And we see the folly of that in statements made by the prophets. Assyria would be the biggest threat to them, one of the biggest threats. And Egypt would do nothing for Israel and Judah, really. We say we trust God. But around that trust, we oftentimes build props. We read the Bible, but we also deeply drink from and even trust other sources of wisdom. That's not biblical. We draw comfort from physical, material things, money, possessions, positions, and status. Sometimes we'll even attempt to buy security, literally buy security, by spending money on friends or family to keep them near so we feel loved and cared for. What the prophets show is that it is folly to trust anything or anyone but God. So Wednesday night in our sessions, we had a beeping noise going on. And a few Wednesday nights ago, we had a beeping noise. And about a year and a half ago, we had a beeping noise coming from back here, okay? And we 
Fine, and I say we, I, I had nothing to do with it. You know who would take care of that kind of thing, Rick and Ken and those competent people. In both cases, the problem was a battery backup unit that had misfired and had gone bad, gotten messed up, and it was beeping, and they had to be replaced. And what these battery backups are is in case we're assembling here and there's some kind of surge in the electricity, there's an interruption in the electricity. In other words, the electricity is not constant. That our apparatus here, our projections and our recordings and our live stream and our computers and everything keep functioning. Those battery backups keep providing electricity. Listen, God does not need a backup. There's not a person, there's not a thing that can support and prop God. Nothing. God doesn't need that backup. And when we have that kind of total dependence on God, we'll have more faithful love for him. Look with me in chapter 10. In Hosea 10 verse 4. They utter mere words. With empty oaths they make covenants. So judgment springs up like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. Remember we said that oftentimes the Israelites either in Israel or Judah, would still be worshiping Jehovah while they were doing all these other wicked and evil things and idolatrous things. And here we see that they would make verbal commitments to God. They utter words and make oaths, but they're mere words and they're empty oaths or vain oaths. In other words, they talked a good game but they were not faithful to God. What usually goes along with promises and oaths? Oftentimes intense emotions. Somebody will say, I I, I promise I'll be there for you. You can count on me. And usually we don't say it like, you can count on me. We'll say it with firmness. You know, there's a little emotional intensity to it. And there are people like that. There are people who will make promises to you with great intensity. They may shed a tear. They may hug your neck and kiss your cheek. And then when you really need them, they're nowhere to be found. That happens. So here were these Israelites who on some occasion would make these big promises to God, get all worked up and make a covenant. And they would utter words about their loyalty to God And like we've seen from Hosea 6, that was like the morning dew or the morning mist. Didn't last. Uh, Occasionally I've mentioned that I played high school football. And I'll put it this way. I was on the team. And I got to play. But, and I like saying this, I was not like a real good player like Vince was. Okay. You can tell by Vince he was good. Just looking at him. But I tell you, the the thing that was interesting, and I played for a really good team. They were a really good team, okay? And they just let me play. But wow. One of the things that characterizes football, and especially amateur football, but all of it, is the team's got to get fired up. And we would gather in that locker room before a game. And man, it was... Our, our locker room was right beside the concession stand, and so in the fall, this hot popcorn and hot coffee smell would come in to our, our meeting room. And for years, whenever I'd smell the combination of hot coffee and hot popcorn, I sort of got all worked up. But we'd get in there, and we would just be like fire in our eyes. And as we were getting our uniforms and our pads on, they'd be playing hard rock, okay? I mean... Stuff that just makes your brain just explode. And by the time we took that field, I mean, we were ready to bite the head off a tiger. 
Okay, and we did. We played the wildcats and the bulldogs and all those animals, and we were really ready to take those animals on. But then something would happen. A few plays into the game, someone about three inches taller and about 50 pounds heavier would hit you and knock you flat. And that feeling changed a little bit. You know what's great about these assemblies? Is that we have our faith recharged. It's part of God's plan for us to assemble and encourage one another and teach one another. Build one another up. That's that's great. But you know what can be a problem? Is we get all emotionally charged in a gathering like this. And then come Monday morning... We're as cold as a block of ice toward God. Sunday is characterized by mere words and empty oaths. And where is the steadfast love? Life's going to knock us down. It's going to knock us around. And words and emotions won't carry us. You've got to have a commitment. No matter how I feel, no matter how I'm treated and what happens to me, I'm going to hang with God. I'm not budging. And it's nothing fiery, it's nothing excitable, it's just solid, steadfast commitment. I'm sticking with God. I'm going to trust Him. And look what else is said in several places. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. Remember how we've talked about that since the prophetic writings are oftentimes framed in poetic verse, that one of the common characteristics of Hebrew poetry, and we cited this a couple years ago when we were studying the Psalms, is parallelism, that statements are laid right beside each other. Like saying, it's a sunny day, and then saying, it's a sunny day, it's a day of warmth in the air. It's sort of saying the same thing, okay? But it's for emphasis. Look at this, what's parallel to one another. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love And no knowledge of God in the land. They go hand in hand. And then chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. And then in chapter 6, verse 6, we saw this a moment ago. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Again, look what's parallel. Look what's thrown beside each other in this poetic language. This faithfulness and knowledge. Ignorance can be deadly. If I had a disease and I was ignorant of it, and even if I had some symptoms, I went to the doctors and they couldn't figure out what the problem is, And if the disease was serious enough, it could cripple me, it could kill me. And even though that ignorance is not my fault, it's not the doctor's fault, you know, they can't know everything, it's deadly. Well, this is an ignorance depicted here that Israel had. It was a deadly ignorance. It cost them the relationship with God. But they weren't blameless. That's why they're being preached to here. They're being challenged here. They're being convicted here. Because they could have known God and his ways, and they didn't. We are responsible to know God and know his teachings. And we're not talking about some kind of advanced academic understanding of, you know, biblical revelation. We're we're not talking about that. 
We're talking about taking the revelation of God, taking these stories and these poems and these letters and these, the, all these accounts and these prophecies and letting God reveal himself to us and learning all we can about God and what God would have us do and what kind of person he'd have us to be. Understand that a lack of knowledge and a fickle faith go hand in hand. When you don't feed yourself with the word of God, you don't learn the word of God, you don't nourish yourself on the word of God, your faith is so weak it can't pick up heavy things. It can't deal with heavy things. And so when heavy things come, your faith just flies. But a deep knowledge of God and of his word creates solid love for him. It, it creates this, this relationship where we know what he's done for us. We know what he's going to do for us. We know how reliable he is. And so that breeds within us trust. I know God. He's explained himself to me. And so day in and day out, I'm with him. I'm going to love and trust him. And then there's this. And this is, this is it's so interesting. A lot of times we'll say the prophets. We're going to say that a lot this year. The prophets or the writings of the prophets. And it's so appropriate because you see the same things it's just in different packages at different times with different prophets. And this is a really strong principle, the one we're about to look at. And I think the prophets, as much as any place in the Bible, can really help us with this. And it's a sobering thought. Turn with me to chapter 1, verse 9. When Hosea is called to be a prophet, his calling involves taking a wife of harlotry, Gomer. And then having these children who will bear names that actually reflects God's relationship with Israel. Or... The lack of a relationship. Look at one of the kids. Chapter 1, verse 9. The son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people. Which means, it's the word loami in Hebrew. Call his name, not my people, for you are not my people. And I am not your God. Okay, let that soak in. God says to these Israelites who had this long heritage of being God's people and God doing great tasks, great work to make them his people. And God through Hosea is saying to them, you're not my people. I'm not your God. Can you imagine a parent saying that to you, or a friend, or even a child? That if you're a father, the child says, you're not my father. And I'm not your child. Wow, that's drastic, isn't it? Or a friend you've known for 30 years, coming up to you and saying, I'm not your friend and you're not mine. That's a tough blow. What God's saying. Yeah, look what Israel had been saying. In chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. A statement of judgment against them, but look at their response. Chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord. Because they've transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Very clear statement repeated scores of times in the prophets. Get ready. I'm going to judge you. Tough consequences are coming because you've been disobedient to me. But look at the response. Verse 2. To me they cry, my God, we, Israel, know you. Israel has spurned the good. The enemy shall pursue him. Even in the midst of their disobedience, this is what Israel said to God. Hey, God, 
You're our God. It's us. It's Israel. You ever see someone you haven't seen in a long time, or you see somebody in a strange place, and you're like, hey, it's me. It's Daryl, okay? And you sort of go, oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, gotcha. They say, it's us, it's Israel, remember us? We're your people. What was God telling them? You're not my people. One way that we develop a steadfast love for God is we don't take him for granted. We sometimes say things like, God will always be there for you. In most ways in which we use that expression, it's true. You know, if you're going through a problem or, or whatever. However, do we realize that at some point this can happen? He won't be there for us. And the reason why, as explained here, is because we've spurned him. Is it possible that we think that our love for God can be hot and cold, our faith can be fickle, and everything's fine because God's going to put up with it. The prophets teach us otherwise. And I'm going to couch it in terms of Hosea language and imagery. We think we can stumble home drunk with lipstick on our collar and a strange perfume reeking from our necks. And God's going to be standing there at the door with open arms and a hot meal on the table. God welcomes the prodigal. Another good song for us today. We sang that prodigal song. As low as we can get and as far as we may stray, if we'll come home to the Father, he'll welcome us with love. But we've got to come home. We've got to leave the pigs. We have to come to the Father to serve him. God does welcome and forgive sinners who repent. The prophets are laced with profound statements of God's mercy and forgiveness. You, you will find them throughout the prophets, but they tend to concentrate toward the end of the prophetic writing, the book. Like chapter 14 of Hosea, verse 4. Hosea writes in chapter 14, verse 4, this is what God is saying, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. That's a statement of forgiveness and restoration. I will love them freely. We would say something like, our, my, we'll be unconditional in our love. We're not going to hold back. There have been doctrines that have been created through time, and, and this was... Even early, early on, a couple centuries after the prophets, there was one very notable one where people have said, you know, really, this God of the Old Testament is fierce and, and full of wrath and judgmental. The God of the New Testament is loving. There must be two different gods. That's hogwash. The prophets are filled with statements about how merciful God is. How he'll take our sins and cast them to the bottom of the sea and we'll never see him again. God is full of grace and mercy. But that's one dimensional. Running hot and cold with God is not the basis of a relationship with him. Because as Hosea writes in chapter 2 and in verse 23, in this offer of restoration, because remember in chapter 1 that kid that was named Loami, not my people? 
Watch how God is offering the reverse of that. Hosea chapter 2, verse 23, And I will sow her for myself in the land. I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. God wants to make us his people. But he expects of us to make a commitment to him. And say, you are my God. And it means more than just words. Now listen, God is the judge of our relationship with him. God is the judge of the state of our relationship regarding the sincerity of our repentance. But this basic principle is seen here in Hosea and other places in the prophets. And yes, other places in the Bible. God will judge and reject. For you see, if we don't comprehend that God is a God of judgment and that we can't trample over him and expect him to just pour grace and mercy without end on us, Unless we realize those things, we're never going to appreciate his amazing grace. Grace is not something he owes us. His saving grace is what he's extending to us, even though we don't deserve it. We should never take for granted God's love and mercy, forgiveness and grace. And when we don't take that for granted, that helps us to build a steadfast faith and love for him. You know, we all want, as humans, we want peace and security, comfort and assurance. And there's probably every, every person in this room would probably think this. That, you know, having a relationship with God is, is a way to have assurance and security and comfort and peace. And that's true. But oftentimes our relationship with God is not characterized by comfort and security and peace. And it's probably because our relationship is so erratic. that we do not have steadfast love for him. Can you imagine there's a bridge that you use on a regular basis? There, we drive over bridges and don't even think about it. And uh, you come up on this bridge one day and there's this sign that says, danger, bridge is unstable, and they detour, surround it. Then the next day, it's open, you use it. And the next day, there's that sign out again, detour, bridge is dangerous, unstable. And it's like every other day, it's okay to use, it's not okay to use. Now, every time you're driving and you approach that bridge, how comfortable are you? Even if that sign is not up, how comfortable are you in driving over that bridge? Well, those signs have conditioned us to have anxiety about it. A steadfast love for God that's built on a commitment that is founded on his word and what's revealed about him and his way for us. Where we don't take him for granted. That's when we'll start experiencing that security and that peace. Because not only do we know that God's always there. We know that we're always going to be there with God. Well, Brother Neil is going to lead us in a hymn. And if there is a soul here who is convinced of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's through Christ that God will make anyone today a person, a son or a daughter that belongs to his people, to his family. And if you're prepared to respond to the gospel by having faith in Christ and confessing that faith and turning from sin, then you can be baptized today into Christ, into his death, raised with him, and have assurance 
that as he's committed his love to you, you're going to commit your love to him. Let's stand together and sing the song. Remain standing for just a moment. We've got a few announcements here. Thank you, Philip, for that excellent lesson. I certainly commend that to everyone. I wanted to read this uh, note from Maxine and Randy. Your kind and thoughtful expressions of sympathy is deeply appreciated and gratefully acknowledged. To our brethren, words can never express our love and appreciation for each of you during Jim's passing and memorial. Please continue to remember us and your prayers as we start this new journey here on earth. Love, Maxine and Randy. And related to that also, let me go ahead and mention this. This was on an email to, uh, to the congregation, but um, Jim has a, a, a memorial related to his, his military service at 12 uh, noon at the State Vet, um, Veterans uh, Cemetery in Black Mountain. There are other details in that email, but thought I would mention that as well, and that's tomorrow. We have a number of folks that are out uh, because of sickness. Earl and Elaine are still not feeling well, and. Related to that, there was going to be an ushers uh, meeting this afternoon, but because Earl is sick, uh, that has been postponed, uh, I, I believe the 25th, if I, if I remember correctly, um, when, is when that will be. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, a few others, let me mention, uh, thankful to see Jennifer here and her uh, family as well. Keep her in her prayers. We're glad to have heard some positive news regarding her heart, and uh, but still there are some other 
serious things going on and with her, and so keep her and her family in your prayers. Um, Michael Williams, as is often uh, the case, is having difficulties and, and uh, pray for him. Lori Mullins has a hurt foot, and uh, Becky is Johnson is home with Luke uh, this morning, and he's not feeling well. Uh, probably others that I haven't mentioned uh, this morning. Justin uh, meant, passed this along to me. Um, there's always things going on in, in the world, you know, and we, obviously we can't mention everything, but he has some, uh, some sort of firsthand knowledge about um, this uh, preacher in Zimbabwe named Alexander, and there was a young woman who was baptized, was it yesterday or this morning? This morning, um, her name is, I probably messed this up, I don't know how it's actually pronounced, but it's uh, Nairodzo or something like that, but he wanted us to mention, wanted me to mention that and uh, keep her in your prayers. And you know, it, it helps, and, and Justin indicated that, that baptisms uh, in this particular church and by this preacher are not unusual. Uh, that it's a regular occurrence, and it's good to know that sometimes those of us, and I know many here are, trying to spread the gospel, trying to teach individuals, uh, and sometimes we get discouraged when we invest a lot of time and energy into someone and nothing ever happens and it seems to go nowhere. Um, but it's also very encouraging to know that in other places on earth, there actually are uh, people obeying the gospel very regularly. And so I'm glad to pass that along. Tonight, this is the first Sunday in, uh, of the month in February, so we will have our evening devotional at 6 o'clock. And um, so all the men come uh, prepared for that. And this particular Sunday, uh, uh, Brother Zachary is going to uh, have our 30-minute lesson so we'll not need quite as many song leaders. I've already got some of the men posted there on the back if you want to see um, what is posted there on the left on the bulletin board, uh, you can see that. We'll need a few other song leaders basically uh, for that. So good to see everyone here and uh, so grateful to have been together with you serving the Lord and worshiping the Lord this morning. We have so much to be thankful for and uh, hope everyone has a good afternoon and uh, hope to see as many as can come this evening at six. We always have a wonderful uh, devotional service together. At this time, Brother Jesse is going to come up and lead us in a closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this day we have had to come and worship you. We thank you for every, each and every day of our lives. Lord, we ask that you would be with each and every one of those that need prayers, be that because they are sick, shut in, or traveling. Lord, you know each and every one of their names throughout the world. Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings you have given us this day, our lives. We thank you for each other. Lord, we thank you most of all for you and blessing us, especially with the blessing of your Son who died on the cross for our sins. It is in his name we pray. Amen.